the UI, and Raul, who should be here but hasn't come to his own session. So um, we started this project when I was visiting the EUI last year. So this is how this team of members kind of came about. And I have also to say that this is a very, very truly preliminary work, work in progress, but I believe this is precisely the type of work where the marginal gain from an audience like you in this venue is uh, the highest. So let's um, jump into the, the paper. So what we want to study in this project is the welfare implications of um, having entrepreneurs in an incomplete market model. So as we know, in the standard incomplete market models, um, there tends to be overaccumulation of capital in the steady state. Um, it is because of the existence of um, income shocks and the lack of state contingent um, contracts they can write to ensure against these shocks. So the precautionary savings motive kind of produces um, capital, which is also um, productive and leads to higher output. So in some ways, consumption insurance, consumption smoothing motive goes in a positive direction with growth. But we have reasons to question this positive correlation with, um, between growth and insurance in, in, a, in a setting where there are entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, so when I think about entrepreneurial projects and investment in entrepreneurial um, projects, it is different than saving in a, in a savings account, right? Um, there are two probably fundamental differences that I can think of. First, investing in an entrepreneur project is highly risky versus putting money in a savings account is, um, is pretty safe, partly because the investment is intermediated by this big banking sector that diversifies for you. And second, um, entrepreneurs also tend to save or invest in projects that are a lot more illiquid than saving a banking account, which helps with consumption smoothing. So we think that um, in a model when there is um, entrepreneurs, agents might be willing to sacrifice insurance, consumption smoothing motive, um, for capital accumulation that breaks this type of positive correlation between growth and insurance in a standard and incomplete market model. So this is kind of what we're after. We want to build a model um, with entrepreneurial choice, occupational choice between workers, being a worker, being an entrepreneur, um, with incomplete markets. So we, the basic elements are follows. So we think of a safe corporate sector with um, aggregate capital A. We think of these as bank accounts, money in the bank accounts. And um, they hire labor in this aggregate produ production function and produce. And then there is also an entrepreneurial sector with ideas or assets K that we think of at the moment as a type of self-employment project. So you engage in this production K and um, the return on this um, production is risky for you. There is entrepreneurial risk in this setting. And all households face a natural borrowing constraint. So workers are also subject to wage risk, um, but entrepreneurs, more importantly, they face basically investment risk when they decide to carry out their own projects. And then we want to um, investigate this notion of constraint efficiency, um, which is similar to um, the work by Davila Hon, Chris and Rails Rule, um, to study how a constraint efficient allocation differs from the competitive market um, outcomes. Yes. So, if I understand that paper correctly, they start from the competitive equilibrium and they consider a specific policy that changes, for example, tax is a capital stock in that economy, right? So, which has both consequences on insurance and on um, redistribution. But here we are kind of taking a step back without looking at specific policies first, but to consider a more general constraint efficient social planners problem, and then ask whether some policies that we see in the real world gets us close 
to the to how well we can do basically. Um, so this is the last point. So see, is there any policies in the real world that gets us closer to this constrained efficient outcome? Um, so what we find, this is, I would like to think of it as just qualitative um, results, but this is what we found from a two period toy model so far. So it might sound very ambitious project, but so far what we have is quite modest. But from this very simple numerical exercise that I'm going to talk about, in detail, we found that um, entrepreneurial choice could be very important, um, a dimension to in, in, in improve the efficiency or, or the welfare of the, um, of the competitive equilibrium. So we found that the planner relative to the competitive equilibrium increases the number of entrepreneurs. And um, basically you are, you are increasing the aggregate productivity in the entrepreneur sector, but lowering the average because you are kind of moving in the marginally less productive guys into the team of entrepreneurs, but increases the, the number of entrepreneurs. You should be it, careful. This is partly a question by the earlier question. What instruments are available to the plan? Why doesn't the plan implement the, comp the complete market cycle? So we, here we use the notion um, constraint efficiency where the planner can dictate allocations, but it cannot complete markets. So basically you can tell the agents what to do, how much to save here, how much to invest in your entrepreneur project or what to become, but you have to respect their individual budget constraint and also marginal product pricing. So it's... So, so no taxes and transfers. No, not uh, no. Okay. You can yes, you can. I mean, you can also think of it as a very personalized because you dictate their no, no, no. their allocations. But the point is that I'm not sure what this corresponds to in, in, in any observations. The notion that you can dictate to people, but at the same time you can't adopt a progressive tax system <laughs> or individual specific tax system. It seems. Why would you do that? I, I wouldn't think of it as a description of reality, it's okay. true, yes. Um, so we also found that relative to the competitive equilibrium, the planner increases the capital, but more importantly, it changes the composition of capital. So the composition of capital is, um, is uh, shifted towards risky um, entrepreneurial capital. And that has an implication that we observe also a loss of insurance in the sense that um, the consumption co varies more with, um, with um, um, the income shocks, earnings shocks. Um, and finally, in order to finance these new entrepreneurs who were not entrepreneurs under competitive equilibrium, the social planner also increases the aggregate debt um, to finance these new projects. Um, so, and if we look kind of more in, into detail of how the social planner does this, we find that there are heterogeneous effects according to whether you're wealth rich, wealth poor. So the, the social planner shifts the investment um, in entrepreneurial capital from wealth rich to wealth poor. So you're encouraging people who are not that wealthy to become entrepreneurs, but nevertheless, these people are kind of adequate entrepreneurs. And then they make the wealth rich save a lot more in safe assets, which kind of um, lowers the equilibrium interest rate, which makes loan cheaper to start these projects and also increases wages, which favors the wealth poor, the very poor who are likely to be workers uh, under all circumstances. So these are kind of different implications from the standard model. So let's start with a two period um, simple model, two period model with heterogeneous agents. So think of um, the agents in this economy having three kind of dimensions that they can differ from each other. So they're endowed with two um, types of permanent productivity. Y is the productivity as a worker and Z is the, is the productivity of um, an entrepreneur. So he can choose depending on his occupation which one is active. Um, and then omega is the initial wealth of that individual. So we think of 
um, permanent shocks to these um, productivities. So there is um, um, permanent, uh, sorry, there's a sh transitory shock in the second period to the permanent productivity of the worker. So this is E with half probability, it's plus and minus E. And similarly, there is a shock in the second period to the permanent um, productivity of the entrepreneurs. This is plus minus epsilon with the same um, probability. And they have time separable constant relative risk version. So this is all standard. So there are two types of assets, the safe asset and the risky asset. So the corporate sector basically employs all the workers in this economy and rents safe assets from the households and produce according to a constant return to scale production function. Okay. Because there are only two periods, so there's full depreciation of capital anyways. And the entrepreneurs, so in the first period, um, this agent decides which occupation to choose. And in the second period, if he chooses to become an entrepreneur, he basically operates his own project. So depending on how much he invests in the first period, K, this is the output from his project in the second period. So there's this um, shock to his productivity, which makes the income as an entrepreneur risky in the second period. And again, there's full depreciation. So if I remember well from the paper, <coughs> and the difference here is that there, I mean, they didn't have an occupational choice, probably. Oh, no, uh, there you do both, yes. So there's capital income. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have, we consider um, discrete choice, occupational choice. Um, so as I said, first period, each agent choose whether to become a worker in the second period or become an entrepreneur. If he chooses to become a worker, then he's safe in the risk-free asset, A, um, and then consume. If he chooses to become an entrepreneur, then he chooses between two um, saving instruments, either the A that goes to the corporate sector or the, the size of your own project, basically, K. Okay. And then you also consume. <laughs> Um, in the second period, the shocks realize, and then basically workers supply labor inelastically, they get their income, and then they consume. So it's a very simple stylized model. The standard notion of competitive equilibrium applies, um, and market's clear. So the entrepreneurs don't hire workers. No, we think of this, think of this as self-employment. Um, in, in the end, we would like to have that, but right now, they don't, yes. Um, okay, so here, the problem of a worker, really simple. First period consumption, omega is the wealth, in, initial wealth, and then second period, depending on which of the shock realizes. And then I use one star to denote worker's problem. And then the entrepreneur's problem is basically um, choosing between two types of assets and then productivity shocks realized and so on. And here, two stars refer to the entrepreneur's problem. And the, um, I also highlight the fact that it, uh, um, it, it, this doesn't mean the realization of shock, it means the standard the evasion of the shock, so it's the volatility of the shock. It's um, a bit abuse of notation. In this context, it's, they are the same thing. I want to <laughs> emphasize that how much you want to invest depends on the riskiness of the project. So it's not a realization, it's the riskiness. Okay, so in order to actually write down the market clearing condition, we need to know a bit about the selection um, mechanism in this, in this world. So the first result that we have says the following. If we have an agent, um, Y, Z, Omega, who is indifferent between becoming a worker and an entrepreneur, then he would strictly prefer entrepreneurship if his initial wealth were increase a little bit. If the entrepreneurial income is more, has a higher variance than the, the um, wage labor income he faced in the second period. So this, this is basically the standard deviation of entrepreneur income in the second period, and this is the standard deviation of the labor income in the second period for that guy. Okay. So 
as you can see, this kind of suggests um, some restrictions on the size of productivity shocks to the entrepreneurs. Because when shocks are small, you would expect that he would like to inv um, invest relatively more, operating at a larger scale, but then you're multiplied to the a smaller number. But when that gets big, you typically want to invest less or operate at a smaller scale. So it kind of puts some restrictions on um, the size of um, risk in the entrepreneurial sector. And if un under that assumption, then we can basically think of a cutoff level defined for um, someone who has this pair of productivity, permanent produ productivities, so that for anybody whose wealth is higher than that cutoff level, you would want to become an entrepreneur. For anybody who, whose initial wealth is lower than this number, you want to um, become a worker in this world. And more generally, as I was explaining before, this describes a standard deviation of two types of income. So if you don't like the um, discrete shock um, distribution, then more generally it kind of describes that. Okay. So just some simple um, sketches of the proof. We basically derive um, this result from Three steps. So first, we have to um, kind of realize that we can write down the indirect utility functions for that guy, assuming that he adopts one or the other occupation, right? And we found that the, if we take the derivative of the difference in this indirect utility, depending on occupation, with respect to the initial wealth, the envelope theorem basically tells me that um, it depends on the level of consumption this guy achieves in one or the other occupation. So if this guy being a worker in the first period achieves a higher consumption, then the marginal would be lower. So he would actually, so this would be a negative, so he would actually want to become an entrepreneur if wealth increased by a tiny bit. So this kind of depends on what, what his selection into which occupation depends on currently, um, under these two hypothetical choices, which one prom promises you a higher consumption level in the first period? If it's the, um, being a worker, then you would want to select into entrepreneurship. If it's being an entrepreneur, you would want to select into and being a worker if you're a bit more wealthier. So, so, so far, you have not made any assumptions about the utility function? Oh, it's the, it's the CRA utility function. Oh, it is CRA. Yes, but oh. to get this, you don't need that. Because I would have thought this was all about whether risk aversion is increasing or decreasing in wealth. I thought that Later, yes, it will be part of the proof. But okay. so far, this doesn't depend on the shape of them. So yeah. the previous proposition was for CRRA? Or? Yes, you need, well, you need uh, the third uh, derivative. So you need the precautionary okay. saving. Yeah. OK, so now the second step is to rewrite the entrepreneur's problem into something that resembles a worker's problem. So here's the following. Let's fix the size of a project, K, at what is optimal for him if he chooses to be an entrepreneur. Let's fix that K double star. And now we let him to choose kind of the total um, amount of investment that you, you, you um, undertake, um, committing to the fact that you have to spend K star star in entrepreneurial project. So this would be a total saving. And you can rewrite it so that it looks as if this is a guy who has a labor productivity of this much and um, facing a labor income, a, a shock to his labor productivity of this much. So basically, I'm rewriting this problem so that this guy faces a problem that's similar to a worker. So now the question is, um, imagine two workers with different pair of permanent productivity and the labor income um, risk and optimize in that environment and achieve the same level of utility whose consumption path is steeper, 
right? So we would like to have the result that um, the guy which chooses to become worker indeed has a flatter consumption um, path so that in the first period he consume, consumes more and then when he becomes richer he would select into the entrepreneurial sector. So that was kind of the idea to compare the consumption profile of these two guys with a understanding that this is this and this can be written in this form but they achieve the same level of indirect utility for this person. Okay, so now we, I mean, we can go through this, but I guess the bottom line is we found that indeed um, so for the, for the worker who faces a higher shock to the productivity, he typically saves more in the first period, which means if this worker, who is the transformed entre entrepreneur, he faces more entrepreneurial um, risk in the second period, he would typically consume less in the first period. And hence, if I have these two people who are indifferent between the two choices, increasing a little bit of wealth will kind of prompt him into becoming an entrepreneur. So that's kind of the idea of how this selection works um, in the setting. So, right. Yes. Yes. So we can actually sign it here. I, I, I want to show that there are two independent effects. One is if you increase the risk, typically you save more because of the precautionary thing. But also, in order to keep you indifferent between these two options, you also face higher. Um, productivity in the second period in that, in that world, and that typically reduces your saving. But we can show under this um, setting that these two, that the first dominates the second. So you still. So that's the game. Now you're going to show that this. Oh, this is the result. Um, yeah. But uh, in, am I supposed to get it already? That, uh, no, it's oh. not immediate. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> it's not immediate. So I have to go through some. Okay, so basically, um, if we, something else that's also kind of um, nice about this condition is that you can check after the fact when you compute an equilibrium what it holds for all the people who are the switchers, right? You can check quite um, conveniently whether they face a higher um, entrepreneurial shock or the labor income shock. So if this is true, we can guarantee that then we can write down the, basically aggregate um, labor supply. So this would be for all those people whose wealth is below this cutoff. So integrating over their permanent productivity Y, this would be the total labor supply in this economy. And then the total um, capital supply to the corporate sector would be just the savings and the safe asset for those people who are in either. Um, camp entrepreneurs, would be entrepreneurs and would be workers. Um, okay, some more properties of um, the cutoff. Here is this slide is a definition for the constraint um, efficient outcome. So we would like the social planner to choose um, the cutoff so he decides who is qualified to be an entrepreneur, who is not. So the social planner gets to choose that. He's also choosing the savings that a worker can do and also the savings and investment an entrepreneur can do with a utilitarian social welfare function. And at the same time, he respects individual <coughs> budget constraints and the marginal pricing. So this would be... Um, and the closest just standard notion of constraint efficiency. Yes. So it's just just to understand, so in the in the complex equilibrium, suppose that they have this decision if they are workers and this decision if they are entrepreneurs, and yeah. social planner sticks to that and just decides on the No, the social plan also chooses the cutoff. So you can overrule the the yeah, pattern so of you're taking their respecting their decisions on consumption and that, condition on the occupation choice, social planner chooses the occupation. 
No, it creates occupation and also dictates what they can do with their savings. But they, but he cannot violate the budget constraint at the individual level, so nor the um, pricing. Okay, so I, don't, I think I missed why he would choose something different than for consumption, given their occupation choice. Yeah. So I think what um, he's saying is, given wages and, mm -hmm. you know, so, so the only thing, the difference between partial equilibrium and comparative equilibrium is the wage. So now suppose you give me the wage and you give me my occupational choice. My first order conditions are going to be exactly the same as the plan. Oh, no, no, because there is um, a pecuniary um, externality in this incomplete market setting. Where, so, so that's the wage. That's summarized by the wage. No, it's not. Oh, so yeah, only in the complete market that. Wage and the rate of return. Oh, the rate of return. Ah, okay. Both yeah. those. Rate of return. But it's the, wage, it's the wage alone is enough to get it. Mm -hmm. Correct. Because you want to get more people into entrepreneurship because it drives down wages, because these guys can work only in the corporate side. Drives up wages. Get more people to go out to drive up wages. No, you drive no, down, down wages. Workers can only work in the corporate sector. Workers want wages. Correct. So oh, if you, if you send more people into entrepreneurship, you drive up wages. I mean, maybe, I don't yeah. know, maybe yeah. I, 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 well, you want to have you, a labor tax. So if you drive more people there, you're lower the aggregate labor supply, right? Drive right. Mm. Okay, okay. But still, the. Um, okay. yeah. I, I think definition is nice to understand the price externality, but uh, as soon as the planner has a kind of a progressive tax, it's okay. better than the constraint efficiency, because it can implement redistribution across agents and provide insurance with Yeah, so, so it depends on, at the end of the day, of the tools you would give to the planner in the market economy. Yeah, I, I, I don't have anything to say which is more superior. Uh, it, it's, it's true. I mean, pro progressive taxes has also complete markets in, in some ways. Okay, so let's go to the um, um, simulation of this simple, it's a numerical illustration of the mechanism. So utility function, as usual, it's um, Cobb Douglas, corporate sector, entrepreneurs facing decreasing return to scale. Um, so depreciation, full depreciation, both sector and so standard. We consider basically five pairs of Y and Z which are right now perfectly positively correlated. So those who are better entrepreneurs are also good workers. Why? Uh, two periods. We have only two periods. Um, so two periods of capital or of people? Of um, both types of capital. Capital and people. But you're right, we are we are trying to go to the two period overlapping just yes. It's in the, is um, uncorrelated to your, to your um, productivity. So for each of these um, five kind of pairs, we have 20 values of um, omegas that distribute uniform for, for these people. And the shock to worker productivity, shock to entrepreneur. One thing, one thing you should check going back to the welfare function, something that bothers me about the utilitarian welfare function. Suppose I start, suppose I assume that markets at the end of the day are complete. Is it obvious that with this welfare function, I don't want to intervene there? I may want to, because I care more about the poor people. Yeah. And if it's there's some possible. indirect way of helping them. So one it's of the things true. that's going on here is you're mixing, mixing up issues about, about yeah. changes in efficiency, does everybody make be, be made better off, yeah. with issues about redistribution. It's true. Yes, right? I agree. So anyway, maybe in your calculations you'll tell us whether this is in fact a Pareto improvement? Or well, we're going to see that okay. there are winners and losers, no, at least for this. Um, so then I'm worried that even in complete markets, you might still need to want, want to intervene. intervene. With yes. The yes. But you could change that, no? You could use a different objective function for the planner. True. <laughs> so here's one possibility yeah. take the complete markets allocation, give everybody a weight 
that is proportional to the marginal utility in mm. complete markets allocation, then that guarantees that you will not intervene in the complete I markets see. allocation and it allows you to distinguish how much you want to intervene to solve externalities <coughs> and how much you want to intervene just because you like poor people more than rich people. That's a great suggestion. Yeah. Yes, we could do that. So here are um, the outcomes. This is without shocks, deterministic, but this is competitive equilibrium social planner. So first we see that um, social planner wants to decrease interest rate and increase wages because um, wages help typically the poor more, who are workers. And it also makes investment cheaper um, to the entrepreneurs who are initially poor. Um, but as what's striking is that the social planning increases a lot the percentage of entrepreneurs in this simple economy and um, changes in the average so productivity. See, it's ex you've got to worry about the fact that if it's, all of it is coming because this is an indirect way of raising wages of poor people, and those are the people I care about, then you're confounding that effect with solving the extra reality. Yes. Yes, but we also see that there is an increase in the output as well. So um, there's some um, efficiency gain, let's say. So here is um, um, how the capital stock changes across these two scenarios. So there is increase in total capital, but the composition changes quite a bit. So there's a lot less safe assets, but a lot more risky ones. And second period output, higher but also the consumption variation is much higher in the um, social planner's um, outcome than competitive equilibrium. And the last is not very important. So okay, selection of the entrepreneurs, which you can, so we, we basically group all the agents according to their productivity as entrepreneurs in five groups. There are five um, um, pairs, remember? And we also group them according to their wealth into five um, groups. So five quintiles. What you can see here is that the, under the competitive equilibrium, the selection is done more in terms of wealth than um, ability. But the social planner basically, kind of, oh sorry, the social planner um, selects the agents more in terms of their ability than wealth, whereas before the selection is mostly done in terms of wealth. So this is one big um, difference. And second, we can look at the indebtedness of this economy. So in the aggregate economy, um, we have basically three, three rows here. The first is competitive equilibrium and then social planner. The, the third line shows you what is the competitive equilibrium response to an occupational structure fixed by the social planner. So this is a way for us to see how much of the action comes from really dictating who does what and how much is from dictating the saving and, and stuff. So we see that this occupation structure is actually quite important in, in determining the, 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 so the actual social planner's outcome. So this is the net asset in terms of debt. You see that um, People go a lot more into debt in the um, constraint efficient out outcome. It's, um, right. And um, it kind of increases with uh, productivity, which is um, usual. And then here, also the number of borrowers increase a lot in the social planner's problem. And this is very highly correlated with the occupation structure. That's it. Suppose you didn't have an occupational margin to play with. Some of these things will go through there as well. I'm just trying to understand, this goes back to comment about, you know, one thing that's actually new is the occupational margin. Mm -hmm. How many of these things rely on that? You mean if someone can be simultaneously a worker and an entrepreneur? Or the other way around, which is basically that, you know, that entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs and <laughs> they just have some wealth and some productivity. All, they have, all you get to decide is how much they invest. So yes, I mean, alternatively, we could fix the, fix the um, occupation structure at the competitive equilibrium level and let the social planner to dictate how much saving you want to do. But what this seems to suggest is that a lot of this um, is coming from the, it's coming from the occupation. Yeah. 
<laughs> we do the same thing for the wealth groups. Um, here, I think what's in interesting is to see that even for the poorer people, basically the, uh, the social planners are selecting the relatively more talented guys in this poor group and ask them to borrow against future income to finance their projects. So they become entrepreneurs. Um, incomes, income and consumption. So the aggregate labor income decreases. <laughs> I'm just pointing you to some that that <laughs> is is that uh, the labor income as a fraction of total income shrinks and. But uh, entrepreneur income becomes more important. But I think what is more interesting is this. So we also look at the consumption variation in, in period two. This is kind of a measure of insurance for us in this two period economy. It's very crude. But basically, we look at how the consumption variability in the second period differs across the two. What you have here is that um, the social planner makes the second period consumption more volatile in a good and bad state for these agents. So this is a sense in which even though there is more output, but there is a loss of insurance to it. But in the longer time horizon, we will have better measures of insurance than this. So there are even more... Um, <laughs> Sorry? He wants to see the winners or losers. Oh, uh, yes, I have it. Um, we only need to wait for two more, but how much, what, how am I doing in terms of time? Eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay, I think I'm fine. So I, we can still spend some time, it, but it's important to kind of understand the graphs because it's not so obvious. So there are basically three different colors. What do they mean? So the blue ones describe people who are workers in either case, both social planner and um, competitive equilibrium. Now these green ones are those who switch from worker to entrepreneurs um, from the competitive to the social planners problem. So these are the people who used to be workers, but social planner make them into entrepreneurs. Okay, so the, the green guys. And then nobody switch back to worker in our setting, but there are also people who remain in entrepreneurship. I, so these I suggest are. one thing that would help these figures? Yes. Do a two-dimensional figure of wealth against ability against your Z picture, mm -hmm. you're going to get indifference curves that tell you in the competitive equilibrium who's going to be in what artificial. Um, and you can transform those ISO artificial choice I see. figures so that people can get an easier. So it's almost like draw, drawing the cutoff lines in these yeah, two. Uh, yeah. That I think is going to be much more intuitive for people to understand the economics. Okay. Point taken. So this is the investment in a risky capital, which is um, kind of a little bit surprising to us at the beginning is that under the competitive equilibrium, the entrepreneurs, the scale of their production increases in their wealth, but the social planner would like them to reduce the scale of production and instead provide more safe assets to the economy to lower the interest rate. So this is kind of one mechanism that um, the social planner exploits. And then this is the safe assets. So here you can see a bit of the indebtedness. For example, these guys who were made into an entrepreneur, they are really going into debt. So these green people, the crosses are what they um, save or borrow under social planners problem. So they're really going into debt, in including these guys in order to start um, their project. So the planner also does that. And now we have the winners and losers. So it turns out that the social planner favors the poor relative to the uh, rich. Um, those people who gain from um, the intervention are those poor who are almost uh, who are workers anyways, but also those who were made to be entrepreneurs, who are relatively poor but um, were made in to become entrepreneurs, but the wealthier guys they they lose um, in this intervention. 
Okay, so um, the specific policy, going back to Javier's question, specific policy that we have in mind is to think about investment loans, whether that can help us to get closer to the constraint um, efficient allocation. So we have some hypothesis. We've living on some other planet than the planet I live on. These programs have been tried in 197 out of 197 countries. Everywhere they're tried, it's just a massive device for corruption. Oh, OK. <laughs> and we're not even getting even, <laughs> even a relevant policy exercise. I was expecting you to ask on uh, size-based subsidy, which no, we claim no, wouldn't no. work. But is, I'll put it this way. We tried it. We've tried it over the last 60 years. It didn't work. So I want to get closer to a constrained efficient outcome. This but, can't be. But, but, but the reason you gave for that is a political economy. They're saying absent other frictions, this is, this is what it takes. So you're saying there's other frictions I'm considering. I don't know what there are. So yes. So are. another way to put it is assuming there is no corruption. Whether no, 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 I'm not. I have a, actually I have a paper on corruption for Chinese politicians, so I know very well the severity of the problem. So, but yes, um, this is something that we think might help us to get closer to um, the constrained efficient outcome. But you can we have to check the right. progressive so yeah. yeah 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 there's no reason for us to think it's yeah. true in uh, spain you can get oh but oh, wouldn't well, that what? qualify for invest investment <laughs> Information on the I was trying to find out how much you could account for Spain's high unemployment rate. <laughs> but criticism is welcome at this, uh, at this point because we haven't completed this uh, analysis yet. So what we are working on right now is this investment loan policy experiment, but also we want to extend this two-period model into um, um, overlapping generation model where you have you know younger actually multiple period and life cycle where there is also a room for um, the irreversibility or the illiquid aspect of investment in in entrepreneurial asset um, on top of the riskiness that we model here in the two period model um, so other things that we want to consider so let me just come don't want to endow the planner with any other instruments. I'm just saying, this seems like the, I want to transfer money to the poor. How do I get to do that? Get these guys to start businesses so that there are fewer people looking for those jobs. I mean, that seems, you know, like a yeah. convoluted way to transfer money to the poor. So Take you, money from Charlie and give it to the poor. That's what <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right now, we are trying to make loans cheaper to you by doing a lot of other things. It's, it's it might be more efficient, who knows? Um, no, in your model, what all they keep saying is, in your model, if you're allowed to lump sum transfers and give it zero, and, and taxes, then the optimal policy is very clear. You just take all the wealth, we distribute it equally. That's what he's trying to say. Once you um, do that, then let them do whatever they want to do. So that's not true, Charlie, uh, because I think different people have different entrepreneurial skills, so you might want to, that's, I'm saying there may be a non-trivial solution, yeah. even if you had taxes here. Yeah. Really? You want to make sure the wealthy, productive, the productive guys have Has sufficient wealth to start right. there. I don't know, maybe something like that. Yeah, to so subsidize their consumption when they start up. Um, Okay, so the goal of the paper again, to study the welfare properties of entrepreneurs in an incomplete market setting. We know that competitive economy is not efficient. Um, and the planner seems to do a bunch of things, try to improve welfare. In particular, it shifts 
lower but not lowest um, productivity, product entrepreneurial um, talented people to, uh, to start their business. They also provide, um, made them to take out um, loans to start their business. And in the end, not everybody wins, but there are some winners and losers. So I'm just repeating what I said. You cannot compare with the simple public market model. It's the infinite horizon, you converge from it. So you could do this setup instead of a two pair duet G model in the infinite horizon model, continuous time to, to solve for the participation choice, which is much simpler than continuous time. You could do it in an Ayagari type model, the same thing. I think it will avoid the difficulties with the OLG setup. We have to think about it, but yes. I think I'm. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.